It's my great pleasure to uh, welcome you to tonight's events. We're in a 119-year-old hall with a 105-year-old society. Our speaker tonight was mixing with Matt Damon and George Clooney the other night, he told me, at the BAFTA Awards, where he received a nomination for his work in a documentary film, which he'll probably tell you about later. My name is Kevin Kelly, and I came over from Dublin today for the event. I know a lot of you have traveled quite a distance, but I do need to do a little bit of housekeeping exercises with you. We notice from the registration list that we have a number of CIBSE members who are not SLL members, and it's just worth noting that you can change, that you can also uh, tick the box for SLL membership free. Um, a part, membership gives you not only access to the code and the handbook and countless guides, it also gives you access to the world's leading lighting research and technology peer-reviewed journal, and uh, it's well worth uh, the value. My role now is just simply to introduce you to the chairman of the London Events Committee, who's organised this event for us tonight, Peter Philipson. Well, good evening and welcome to the Trotter Patterson Lecture. We first used this building last year, and one of the things that's interesting about it is that it's the first room to be built in London electrically lit. So this was the first venue that wasn't converted from gas. And this is a picture of what it looked like back in uh, 1905. And that was what the lighting used to look like. So this is a rather special venue to have uh, a lecture about vision and light. I've also found this um, facsimile of uh, a paper given in 1949 saying that the IES, which is the society name that we used to have, was going to start a Trotter Patterson lecture and it was going to be on every two years and this was the original uh, document which charts how it started. So two years later in 1951 we had our first Trotter Patterson lecture. Over the years we've had some great speakers including the Nobel Prize winning scientist Sir Lawrence Bragg and in the audience uh, tonight we've got two past speakers. One is Professor John Barber who spoke four years ago about a different aspect of vision to what we've got today. He's, he's, come, to, he's come to support us which is very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And also we have Bernie Davis, who in 2003 gave us a lecture on the lighting of television programs such as The Last Night of the Proms and many state functions, and he's here tonight as well. Okay, there'll be a chance to ask questions at the end of this talk. Tonight's speaker is Professor of Neuroscience and, and Psychology at the University of London in the School of Advanced Study, an Emeritus Professor of Neuroscience at Oxford University. Between 2003 and 2007, he was the Chief Executive of the Research Council. And then he started his career at Cambridge where he studied medical science. He did his PhD um, at Berkeley, California. He then went back to Cambridge for 11 years and then went to Oxford as the Wayne Fleet Professor of, Neuro of Physiology. His research interests are in development of the brain, many aspects of vision, the plasticity of the brain, and neurodegenerative disorders. He is the Fellow of the Academy of Sciences and a Fellow of the Royal Society. I'd like to welcome Professor Colin Blakemore. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Peter. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk tonight about, um, about vision, 
And as John said, his lecture was about vision possible, but then he understands, understands more than I do. It, it looks pretty impossible to me. Uh, and I'm going to, um, well, to, to paint a picture of conventional understanding of how vision works, how our visual systems work, um, but then question the reality of the information that the brain receives um, and come to what I think are some quite challenging conclusions. The contradiction between what we know goes on in our heads and the appearance of this wonderful, seamless view of the world that we have. Um, this um, image, just uh, uh, obviously familiar to all of you, one of the great uh, iconic images um, of Western art. Um, how many times have you, have you seen this before? Yeah, any of, you, any of you see anything unusual at all? Just put up your hand if you see anything unusual. One, two, one, okay. Nothing else for the rest of you. Well, it's God, you see. Um, it, God is being photoshopped in. It's not the original God. That's um, a portrait of Darwin. Uh, now, there's no, um, you know, I'm not meant trying to make a political point here. I'm making a scientific point. Um, the, the image, although completely familiar to all of you, um, apparently is not familiar enough that you detected, or more than one or two, uh, one or two of you um, detected, such a gross difference from the reality of what should be your memory of the, of the image. So you should question how reliable your recollection of even extremely familiar, often repeated, static visual scenes, like pictures like, uh, um, uh, like this uh, really, really are. Uh, and that's one of the questions I'm going to ask. How certain can we be about our visual experiences? So I'd like to, to um, play a, a little movie, which some of you will have seen before, I suspect. But if you just um, watch very carefully, this is a couple. Hi, I'm Richard. This is Sarah. And we're going to perform the amazing color-changing card trick with this blue-backed deck of cards. Now, the idea is very simple. I'm just going to spread the cards in front of Sarah and ask her to push any card towards the camera. Okay, let's see. I'm going to go for this card here. Okay. Now, Sarah could have selected any card at all from the deck, but she selected the card which is now face down on the table. And what I'm going to ask her to do is show us which card she selected. Right, so the card that I chose was in fact the Three of Diamonds. The Three of Diamonds, okay, excellent choice. That card goes back into the deck. Now I'm just going to spread the cards face up on the table. Do a little click of the fingers, and you'll see that Sarah's card here has now got a blue back. Not particularly surprising. What's slightly more surprising is all of the other cards have got red backs. And that is the amazing color-changing card trick. Now, um, did any of you see anything unusual about that? Anybody? One or two? Great, great. Now, what you're going to see now is exactly the same sequence, exactly the same, filmed from a single camera that viewed it continuously without ed any editing cuts. So this is the reality of what was happening. Hi, I'm Richard, this is Sarah, and we're going to perform the amazing color-changing card trick with this blue-backed deck of cards. Now the idea is very simple. I'm just going to spread the cards in front of Sarah and ask her to push any card towards the camera. Right, okay, let's see. I'm going to go for this card here. Okay. Now Sarah could have selected any card at all from the deck, but she selected the card which is now face down on the table. And what I'm going to ask her to do is show us which card she selected. Right, so the card that I chose was in fact the Three of Diamonds. The Three of Diamonds, okay, excellent choice. That card goes back into the deck. Now I'm just going to spread the cards face up on the table. Do a little click of the fingers, and you'll see that Sarah's card here has now got a blue back. Not particularly surprising. What's slightly more surprising is all of the other cards have got red backs. <laughs> 
And that is the amazing color changing art trick. How, how, really, genuinely, how many of you saw any of those really dramatic changes? One, one or two. Very bad picture, it's true, but you know, you shouldn't miss changes in the color of clothing, the backdrop, the tablecloth, and so on. So what does this tell you? First of all, it tells you that all of those efforts that film directors put into continuity in pictures is, you know, to a large extent unnecessary, except, of course, they have to cater for the 1% of the audience who, for any particular change, might just by chance spot it. So um, we are extremely bad at detecting changes of scenes if there's a cut between one scene and, and another. Um, ch gross changes, how many people are present in the scene, what the color of the background of the clothes they're wearing is, and, and, and so on. Um, shouldn't this lead us, lead us to question then how secure our impression is of our visual experiences. We think that we're just observers in a continuously flowing movie that's happening around us, and we happen to enjoy the pleasure of watching it as it's happening. There's no sense that it has just begun, that every millisecond that we think about a visual experience, we're in the middle of it. It has a past, and of course it has a present and a future. But I'm going to argue tonight that we have no visual past. There is no past to our, no, no visual past, no detailed, representational, image-based visual past. We live in a tiny snapshot of the present with a few vestiges of information about the, the past, enough to know sometimes that there have been major contradictions um, between what, we, what, what is now happening and what, uh, what happened in the past. Um, in a sense, watching a, watching a conventional movie would be impossible if we did rely on the continuity of visual experience. If that was really the case, then we would be incredibly disturbed by the, the cuts in viewing angle, size, zoom, and so on, that are absolutely conventional in movies. I'll argue that the, uh, the reason we're able to tolerate those so readily is that, that our own vision is um, without past and, and consists of continuous cuts in vision. This phenomenon that you've just seen demonstrated so dramatically, that was by Richard Weisman, who's the professor for the public understanding of psychology at the University of Hertfordshire, is just one of a whole catalog of phenomena called change blindness that have been documented over the last 20 years or so. I'll give you another example. Um, imagine that you're driving along the road, and, well, it doesn't look like a a wet day, imagine it's a wet day and there's mud on the road, the car in front of you suddenly throws up onto your windscreen a splattering of mud. Um, did anyone see anything happen except the appearance of the, the synthesized mud? Nobody at all, that's amazing. I'll, I'll do it again without the mud. Let's go back to the beginning. There it is. And this is what happened. Okay. The, the line in the middle. Um, and just to convince you, let's go back and do it with the mud, if you, don't, if you really don't believe it. There it is. Watch the line. You didn't see that at all. Um, so just the mere, the mere appearance of some distracting stimulus, even in a continuous scene, um, can apparently mask or conceal really dramatic changes, very high, high contrast changes in the rest of the, the image. So what's happening? The, the brain's observing information coming in from the retina. What happens to that information about the sudden change of brightness as extra lines are added to the, the road? It's just one example of, um, uh, of this uh, change blindness um, phenomenon. L let me show you another rather, rather different example. If you just watch this movie, just fixate on the red spot in the middle, see these changing spots. Now what happens when it moves? What happens when the surroundings move? Watch again, should repeat, here we go. Think about the, the dots in the surroundings while they're moving, and I'd posit that they, they stop changing in color, yes? Well, they don't, they're changing all the time, you just don't see the changes. Well, that's interesting in itself, that you don't detect changes in color when the stimulus moves across the retina. Even more from a philosophical mind, new role as a, you know, as a, as a pseudo philosopher, the more interesting question is then, um, what color are they when they're moving? In reality, they're all changing. Do they appear uncolored? Well, no, they don't, I think. They appear colored. 
If you focus your attention, don't look at it, but just focus your attention on any one of them while you're looking at the red dot in the middle, then I think you might detect that it is changing, but only the one that you happen to be attending to. The rest appear to be colored, but their colors can't be correct because we know they're changing. They seem to be colored, but you don't see them change. Agreed? Yeah? Just try attending to any one of them while it's moving. You can, you can make out sometimes the changes but the rest just seemed colored and not to change. It happens also with shape. So here's another example. Here these little blobs are all changing shape, just as before, and they change shape continuously at the same rate, every one of them, but you don't detect the changes during the rotation. Yet they still appear to have shape, even though we know that they don't have consistent shape. So very interesting phenomenon it tells something about the problems of detecting changes in a stimulus while that stimulus is moving across the retina, being sampled, sampled at different points across the retina. Perhaps it's not surprising, moving across different parts of the retinal array, therefore different regions of the cerebral cortex as well, um, that the comparison between one point in the sequence and another might be more difficult if different sets of neurons are involved in encoding the two different forms of the stimulus. Still a, little, a bit surprising, really. You'd think that's a basic requirement of our visual system that it's able to detect when changes happen. All right, let's go back and think about the conventional approach to explaining vision, where it came from, and what, what, we, what, what the textbooks say happens. Well, it, um, a, good, a good starting point is um, and that I think most, most people who work on vision would agree that whether it's from a comp computational point of view or a, or a physiological point of view would agree with this, that the problem of vision is to infer from the image on the retina, what the outside world is like. We don't see our retinal image, we see the outside world, but we see it by virtue of the fact that it forms an image in our eye and we use that image to interpret what's there. Now, you know, you as, as experts in optics know immediately there's a problem here, there's, a, there's the so-called inverse problem, that you can never derive with certainty the true shape of an object in three, three space that caused a particular image in the retina because the image is two-dimensional. Uh, so in principle, uh, any of an infinite range of possible object shapes could have generated what happens to be on your retina. Imagine that you have an exactly circular image on your retina, just a round ring. It could be generated by a hoop, which is really round, being out there in space, fronto-parallel, and you're just looking at it. Or it could be generated by any range of oval shapes viewed at an appropriate angle to cast a, an exactly circular image on your retina. And there's no way of disambiguating those things from the image alone. You can make assumptions about what you're looking at. If you recognize what the object is, then immediately it helps you to disambiguate the image. But the, imi but the image is not providing um, secure information about the nature um, of the world. But that's the task, to try to infer something of the outside world from our retina. Okay, so where do we start the story? Could, could have started it in the 10th century. Um, let's, let's, let's start in the, in, in, in the 17th with Descartes. Important views, he was one of the first people to observe the retinal image directly and to understand the, the optics correctly. Um, Christopher Scheiner had, had done this same experiment 20, 30 years earlier, but this is, uh, this is Descartes' view from La Dioptrique. Uh, what he did was to get a, an ox eye from the local abattoir fresh ox eye, so the cornea lens was still clear, cut a, a hole in the sclera at the back of the eye, put a piece of paper onto the vitreous, the jelly of the vitreous, replacing the retina with a piece of paper, and then he held the eye up and was astounded to see an image formed on the paper, an upside down image, of course, of his room, looking at the windows and so on. Now imagine to um, to a philosopher, because Descartes, as well as being a, a, a great scientist and physicist and mathematician, geometer and so on, was also a philosopher. And he was interested in epistemology and how we get knowledge of the world. Imagine the impact on, on such a philosopher to see a, a bit of the body, a dead bit of the body of an animal capturing, internalizing um, a view of the world. For people who, who ask questions about how we know about the world, that must have been a pretty riveting experience. So much so that he imagined that the formation of the image was an, an absolutely essential part of the process of understanding the world, and that that same 
topography, topographical form of representation might continue into the brain. So this is from um, the uh, Traité de l'Homme, the Tractus de, de Homine, um, in which he, this is a very famous picture from the history of, uh, of neuroscience, and he represents the way, in, in the imagined way, lots of errors, but the imagined way in which the two eyes might, might have sent the information in from uh, the, their images into the brain. Um, if you follow through the two optic nerves, you'll see they don't cross over, they don't partially cross over as they do in reality, they stay separate from each other. But you notice that the, the uh, nerve bundles in the, in the um, optic nerve are drawn as, as parallel, almost like a coherent fiber optic bundle, conveying um, a, a, a continued representation of the image, perhaps in the form of vibration, he and Newton, both thought the nerves might work by vibrating slightly. And that then delivers into the brain a pattern of vibration corresponding to what each eye is viewing in the outside world. Uh, so now, how does he imagine it arriving in the brain? You can see that, that the ends of the nerve fibers end in little openings on the surface of that round space in the, occupying the brain. That's supposed to represent one of the ventricles of the brain. He was following the classical uh, ideas established in the second century by the uh, Roman um, physician and anatomist Galen, who was the first person to observe the ventricles in the brain filled with cerebrospinal fluid. Um, and this was at a time when Aristotle's views about, about the importance of fluids in the body determining health or disease were absolutely dominant, and they remained so for another thousand years or more. Um, so discovering a new fluid in the body, cerebrospinal fluid, was pretty significant, especially when it was a transparent fluid. So um, this fluid in the brain was, uh, to this fluid in the brain was attributed almost magical properties, and it was thought of as being the seat of, um, of perception, of understanding of, of the mind. Uh, and the, the process that was support, supposed to happen, or thought to happen, was that information from the senses impinged on the fluid in the brain, set up agitation in the fluid of the brain, which then passed back through the different ventricles of the brain to, um, to be processed so as to produce understanding of the world, um, estimatio and rationes, and things, these are the Latin names attributed to the process, and then delivered finally either to be stored as memories or to be used to control movement. And although the, the anatomical details are, are, are just nonsense, that idea that we work by taking in information from our senses, processing it, and then using it, well, remembering some of it, um, but also just using it to control our actions, is still exactly the way that we think of the brain as um, working. So not, not so crazy an idea. So here was De Descartes' interpretation of the first stage in that process, uh, the signals from the senses. And you see the preservation of a kind of representation, a kind of image inside the brain was still important to him. But, and he has been criticized by people who clearly haven't read the original um, as being naive in thinking that, that, that just creating an image in the brain was an explanation for seeing. Well, he was quite clear about that. He says in La Dioptrique, it can't be just by virtue of this picture in the brain that we see the world because we'd need another set of eyes inside the brain to look at that picture in order to understand it, and then another set of eyes inside the, the brain of that viewer, and so on. There'd be an endless um, circularity. So he knew that, the, that there had to be different mechanisms to explain seeing, and he imagined two sorts of mechanisms. One, an automatic one, in which the vibrations from the eyes would just set up vibrations in the fluid, which would be transmitted out through other nerves to the muscles, the muscles controlling the eyes and the hands, to produce automatic reactions, like the movement of a clock, as he said in, in the Traité de l'Homme. He compared the human brain to a clock and just said, you know, I want you to imagine that everything we do, um, seeing and hearing and feeling and, and, and having emotions and making decisions and uh, moving um, muscles, everything happens automatically, just like the movements of a clock. But he realized that something was missing from that explanation, and that is that we also have feelings about those things. We can, we can, you know, we can see them. We have conscious experiences of the world as well as just reacting to the world. So he conceived this concept of, 
of, of a double process happening, the brain dualism, Cartesian dualism, that there were the automatic processes, and in parallel there was some kind of almost magical process um, which was interpreting and viewing what was going on, and occasionally even intervening in questions of moral choice and so on, and that is the soul. So the same information was delivered to the soul. And the soul, in this case, is represented by that, that little strange little organ in the middle of the ventricle, which represented the pineal gland, and he thought the pineal gland was the sort of interface between the, the hardware of the, of the brain and, and the, the immaterial soul. And, and you see the way in which he imagined the vibrations passing through the fluid from the two pictures, two eyes, remember, two pictures, onto the soul to give the soul a single and re-inverted view of the external world. See how they converge and the, and the image is re-inverted. It's combined, the two eyes combined, binocular fusion and re-inversion of the image. So the soul has the pleasure of seeing a single view the correct way up while the rest of the brain just goes on working automatically on the basis of uh, this parallel processing of the information derived from the, um, the eyes. This, this view that somehow, although it, it, we can't think that an image actually creates our perceptions or creates our understanding, the idea that we, we depend crucially on the continuous flow of information in some sort of topographic representation through our brains is still very much dominant and to a large extent, it's true. Um, this is um, a, an ophthalmoscopic view of the fundus of the human eye. Looking into the eye with an ophthalmoscope, um, what do you see? You see in the middle this pigmented area, that's the central fovea of the, of the eye, remember, the part that we point towards things when we look directly at them. Um, there are, no, there are blood vessels running across the surface of the retina uh, which avoid that region. That's part of one, one of the adaptations of that region to make sure that the image is particularly high in quality and clear. Um, you can see on the right-hand side that uh, disc, part of a, a, a disc, that's the optic disc, the nerve head, the place, uh, the perforation in the back of the eye through which all the optic nerve fibers pass to make, uh, the, the nerve fibers from the ganglion cells pass to make up the optic nerve. Uh, so they run across, the nerve fibers run across the surface of the retina and plunge down through a hole in the sclera to go out and form the optic, optic nerve. If you imagine a cross-section through the middle of that, of the fovea, this is what it looks like. You see the, time, the, the, the scale at the bottom in, in, uh, in, mic, in micrometers. There's this um, um, pit in the front of the retina. You imagine the light's coming from below, it's gone through the lens, it's being focused. Um, it has to pass through layers of nerve cells, the ganglion cells, bipolar cells, other sorts of cells in the retina, before it finally strikes that array of little vertical things. Those are the outer segments of the photoreceptors, which contain the pigment that catches the light. So the, the, an image has to be formed on that array of photoreceptor outer segments after passing through layers of nerve cells. And uh, one of the other adaptations of the fovea, as it's called, the central fovea or the central pit, is the scooping away, the moving aside of as many of the nerve cell bodies as possible so as to clear the way and, again, to improve the quality of the image. So everything's focused on, on high-quality image formation and also high resolution. If you look at those photoreceptors in the middle there, they are amongst the smallest cellular processes in the body. They're about a micrometer and one and a half micrometers. Um, in cross-section. They're very densely and regularly packed in a hexagonal array. Um, those are the cones in the central... There are no rods in the central fovea. Those are the cones, maybe 50, 60,000 of them, which sample in great detail the image just at the point that we're looking at. And as you go into the periphery, things deteriorate fairly rapidly. The spacing of cones, more important, the um, the numbers of ganglion cells per um, cone. In the central fovea, each cone has a private line to at least one ganglion cell, therefore one optic nerve fiber. So we are aware, and there's lots of evidence for this, we are perceptually aware of individual cones in, in the very center of our fovea. We have direct access, the level of consciousness, to information from individual cones in the central fovea. In the periphery, you can't because you haven't got enough ganglion cells about one and a half million fibers in the optic nerve, that's equal to the number of ganglion cells, and there are about 110 million photoreceptors. So there's got to be huge convergence. At some point in the retina, it's certainly not in the middle, there's no convergence, there's actually divergence 
So there's massive convergence in the periphery, which effectively reduces the sampling, the spatial sampling of the image hugely. Therefore, visual acuity falls off quite rapidly into the peripheral field. I mean, that, that alone is sort of interesting, because when you just look at a scene, just look at a scene, you're entirely unaware of the fact that the image, your, your perceptual image, if you like, is terribly degraded in the periphery. It doesn't, doesn't feel like that at all. The, the room appears e equally consistent everywhere. And it actually, it'd be very odd if you were aware of the imperfections in your vision. That's not what vision is for. It's not to tell you how it works, and it's certainly not to tell you about its own imperfections. It's to try to make the best guess of what the world is like. But the fact is, and as soon as you begin to concentrate on it, or particularly to measure it, you find that your vision in the periphery is very, very poor. In the, um, you can ask, I mean, one question that the you know, physicist would immediately ask, and, and um, uh, Hecht, Schleer, and Perrin in the 1940s did ask was, you know, how sensitive can our photoreceptors be? And, and uh, the, the most sensitive photoreceptors are not the cones that we use in daylight vision, they're the rods that we use at night. Um, and, and an obvious question is, are, are, we, um, are, are we limited by some crude biological inabilities of our photoreceptors, or are we limited by the nature of light itself? Um, nowadays, not then, but nowadays, you can buy a you know, phototransducer, a phototetector that can count single photons, count single quanta. Um, but it, when, the, when these experiments were done in the 1940s, it was certainly not thought that human beings could possibly respond to single photons. But in fact, experiments on human observers showed that they could um, detect a, um, a flash of light uh, in the dark, after dark adapting, when usually, on average, the, the light flash contained about eight photons. But those eight photons could be scattered over quite a wide area of retina. They didn't all have to be focused on exactly the same photoreceptor. They could be delivered to different photoreceptors. So the conclusion from the, that experiment, classic experiment in psychophysics, was that each individual photoreceptor must be capable of generating some sort of signal when it catches only one photon. And that's been um, very elegantly showed with, shown with physiological um, methods. This is um, Trevor Lamb's work in, in, uh, in Cambridge with um, Alan Hodgkin, uh, originally, um, measuring the electrical responses of individual rods. In this case, it was from, I think, a toad, the retina of a toad, freshly dissected, that's it there in, in vitro. Um, and the, the little thing that's sticking out at an angle is one of these um, um, outer segments of a rod being sucked into a, a glass capillary. That's what that tube is that's coming down. Here it is on the right-hand side. You can see the outer segment inside the capillary. And the capillary is filled with, a, you know, with a, a salt solution, so it can be used to measure current flow um, generated by voltage changes in the or resistance changes in the, uh, in the outer segment. They then expose, because it's a glass tube, they can put flashes of light onto the outer segment and ask, you know, how big an electrical response do you, do you get? And they showed that the receptor gave graded responses with different intensity, and they, they then went down to levels of intensity that were, on average, equal to one, fo one photon per flash of light. Um, well, of course, you can't deli reliably deliver one photon at a time. You can filter the light down to the point where the average is one photon, but you'll know that the, the number of photons present in the flash will vary with a Poisson distribution. The mode will be at one, but sometimes there'll be two, occasionally there'll be three. Quite often there'll be none, and so on. So they looked at the response, and they had no way of knowing um, uh, uh, what each flash contained. But they looked at the electrical responses. And here they are, these are the electrical responses from one single rod, isolated rod, to flashes, each of those blips at the bottom is one of these single photon flashes of light, which were sometimes one photon, sometimes zero, and so on. And there are the responses. And what you can see is that the responses are graded in steps. Sometimes nothing happens. Sometimes one of those small sized events happened, and sometimes something twice as big, very rarely something three times as big. And they were able to plot out the amplitudes of these responses, and they are a Poisson distribution. So it's quite clear that individual rods are capable of producing an electrical signal um, when they absorb a single photon of light. They're as sensitive as they can be. So this produces a nice 
physicist's view of the eye. It's like, it's like a digital camera. It has a, a dense array, pixelated array of highly efficient uh, detectors which are sampling perfectly. Actually, there's a beautiful match between the density of the receptors and the quality of the image, perfectly sampling the image right in the middle of the eye. But let's not forget that it a terrible fall off of processing very quickly into the, um, the peripheral field. But in the center, it looks as though there really is pretty good preservation of information. It's then passed up to the brain. And um, you know, if I'd been giving this lecture 50 years ago, I would have said, and there's a visual area at the back of the brain. There might be another one around it. You know, we don't quite know what the second one does. Well, now we know that in primates, there are at least 25, maybe 30, perhaps in humans, 35 or more distinct and separate visual areas covering the whole of the back of the cerebral hemispheres. About a third of the entire area of your gray matter is devoted to visual analysis, spreading up into the parietal lobes and down into the infratemporal lobes. So the information comes in. This is a picture on the top left, a picture of um, the rhesus monkey brain, fairly similar in its organization to human. Um, the the back is, it's the right hemisphere, so the, the, the back is at the, at the, on the left side, the front is on the right side, and all of those um, areas which you can see in shades of, of red and pink and orange and yellow are visual areas. The others in blue are, are areas responding to, to touch and, uh, and further forward areas involved in control of movement and so on. Now down below, that funny thing is, is an imaginary flattened view of the gray matter peeled off the hemisphere. And it shows, this is, this is from the 19, I guess from the 19, late 1980s, showed the state of knowledge of these, of the number of different visual areas. There's V1 at the back, and then V2 um, surrounding it, the second visual area, then V3 and V4 and so on and so on, marching forwards um, and downwards. Uh, each area being defined in a number of ways. Sometimes anatomically, sometimes you can see the boundaries under the microscope between the areas for some of them. Um, but by the nature of the mapping of the visual field, in general, as you go through the early areas anyway, you find as you go from point to point across the cortex, there's a representation of neighboring areas of the visual field with a sudden transition at the boundary where that map reverses, it starts to go in the other direction. It goes from the center out to the edge of the visual field, then back into the center, and then out as you go from one area to another. Um, and then as you go further forward, that the precision of the mapping is lost. But what you start to see is that areas become focused and, and concentrated on analyzing one particular aspect of the, of the visual um, stimulus, at least some of them. Some of these areas have evidence for that. Um, for instance, if you see the orange area in the middle, V4, um, the fourth visual area, uh, certainly some parts of that seem to be specialized for the analysis of color. Um, and in humans, the damage in, in that region of the cortex can lead to a condition called um, central achromatopsia, a loss of color vision, despite the fact that the eyes are intact and the receptors are all working. So there can be central um, loss of color vision through very specific damage to parts of the visual cortex. And interestingly, immediately adjacent to it, you see the yellow area right next to it with MT on it, middle temporal. That's a very small but very distinctive area identified in monkeys, certain, as you'll see in a moment, certainly present in humans, um, which seems to be devoted to the analysis of movement in the field. And perhaps three-dimensional distance as well, but, but certainly movement. And interestingly, uh, not at all interested in color. So two areas right by each other, side by side in the, re in the rhesus monkey brain anyway, one, one partly concerned with color, the other one not at all. So this is as Semi Ozeki, who was one of the pioneers in this area at University College, um, said there's a sort of division of labor in the analysis of the visual scene between these different areas. Okay, so the, um, I'll, I'll talk, um, uh, I'll talk, uh, in a moment about that particular area, MT, it's called V5 um, sometimes, um, which seems to be concerned with movement analysis, the, the nerve cells respond to movement in a particular direction, each one, each nerve cell responds to movement in, a, in, a, in its own preferred direction. Um, 
this is, the, this is a, a picture, again, fairly early on, so there are many more areas identified now, showing the, the way in which some of these areas are disposed across the surface of the brain. You can see them flowing upwards, the so-called dorsal stream of processing up towards areas in the parietal cortex, and that's thought to be more concerned with relatively unconscious automatic reactions, like the kind of sort of Descartes-type automatic reaction to visual input, and that the flow of information downwards through V4 and then into the infrotemporal cortex, much more concerned with object recognition, identification, face recognition, and in the end, moving into visual memory. So, you know, there's it, a parallel with Descartes' views that there are two tasks for vision, one to, uh, to initiate action, the other one to, to give you the pleasure of knowing what's going on, to enable you to identify things and recognize them and then remember them. And here it is represented in the, in the brain. Well, the introduction of, um, of fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging, only 23 years ago or thereabouts has really, has really radically changed uh, the detail of our knowledge of the organization of the human cerebral cortex. Um, and in particular, it enabled neuroscientists to compare human beings with the much more detailed knowledge that was known from the study of, of animals, especially monkeys, and to see that there are close homologies and analogies between um, the organization of the human um, cerebral cortex and, and particularly the monkey brain. So this is the, um, the 3T scanner in, in the um, Functional Imaging Center at Oxford. Um, and I'll just show you one example of the kind of thing that you would have seen these sorts of images before, the sorts of things that you can, you can find using this, this technique. Um, if, you are, if you put people in the scanner and just ask them to look at a static pattern of contrast, say black and white dots, compared with the, and most MRI experiments involve a comparison between one condition and another so as to extract the pattern of activity um, attributable to the difference between the two conditions. So in this case, if you imagine looking at just a, a gray patch or just resting and looking at nothing, compared with looking at a static patch and ask where has blood flow increased, because that's what MRI measures. It measures water distribution, therefore blood flow. What you see is an, is a, is a, an increase, maybe a few percent, increase in blood flow in the very back of the brain, this is a horizontal section of the brain, uh, um, including that first visual area where the, most of the information from the eyes arrives. That's fine, it's just what you'd expect. But if you now say, well, let the person look at this, the moving pattern, and say, um, what areas are activated by the moving pattern that are not activated by the, uh, the static pattern? So take the difference between them. Is there anything extra happening in the brain as a result of these, the dots moving? then what you see is a quite different pattern of activity. The, the moving dots certainly also activate at the back, but if you subtract out the activation from the static patterns, what you see is that, these two distinct regions just above the ears here, and that's the human analog of the monkey um, V5 or middle temporal area. It responds selectively to, to movement. And again, damage bilateral, both sides of the brain, very unusual, but bilateral damage to that re region from a stroke can lead to a very rare condition called um, akinetopsia, um, an inability to, to detect movement, or at least under most circumstances, an inability really to see movement. Things, when they move, just appear to be in one place, then to be somewhere else, and, and what happens in between isn't seen. Even though uh, other things are pretty normal in, su in such individuals, they can see color, they can see shape and form and distance, they can recognize faces, but they just don't detect movement. So it all fits quite nicely. Information comes in to the primary visual area as a kind of very detailed map, just like Descartes said, and then different sorts of information are sent off to different regions for further um, analysis, and that results in the picture that we have of the world. Um, well, it, it, it's a bit more complicated than that. I mean, it, it, it's, I mean, it's really Descartes' problem. Just having activity distributed in a pattern doesn't explain how we see and I'm certainly not going to try and offer an explanation of that, there's still a huge gulf in understanding between the activity of nerve cells responding to things in the image and the owner of those nerve cells having visual experiences. We just don't understand that process, the transfer to a subjective experience. Now, one question you can start to ask, though, once you know the particular bits of the brain are doing something, you can start to ask some questions about how 
sophisticated the computations because we think, you know, the brain, even though it's not like a PC or something, the brain is essentially a computational instrument. It's taking information in, it's analyzing it, coming up with conclusions. So it's computing. Well, an important computation recognized by Helmholtz that has to be done in order to have a, a stable view of the visual world is to know whether movements that happen on your retina are due to movements of things in the world or due to movements of you. Because whenever you move your eyes, then of course the, the, the scene that you're looking at shifts to different parts of the retina as you move your eye around. In other words, it moves across the retina. So how do we know that movements, um, we're not producing movements ourselves when we see something moving the field? That, that requires, um, thought to require a computation in which you have to know what your eyes have done either by, as Sherrington said, by monitoring with receptors in your eye muscles, stretch receptors, where your eye is moving, or simply by knowing what signals you've sent out from your motor system to your eyes. You have a kind of second copy of the instructions you gave about the eye movements and comparing that with the information you get from the retina. And if they agree with each other completely, has yes, something moved, but the eye moves through the same angle you know, in the opposite direction, then the movement must have been caused by the eye movement, so forget it, you don't see it. Um, but if movements occur without a, a corresponding eye movement, uh, then that really must be moving to the world. So you can ask um, if this specialized area, M MT, responds to movement in the world, is it capable of performing that computation? So here's a little experiment that uh, um, Loredana Santoro, a graduate student of mine, did, which suggests that it is. Um, and what she did was this. She put people in the scanner, asked them to fixate, the, they saw nothing in the visual field except this display, stripes, and she asked them simply to focus on the, the cross at all times. So now you're holding your eye stationary, there are these stripes moving backwards and forwards in space, you see them moving, and they're moving on your retina, of course, the image is moving on your retina, but your eye is stationary. So, of course, that produces huge activation in, in MT, in the, in the human area. It's the perfect stimulus for MT, as described in animals and previously shown in humans. But now you can do this experiment. Keep the line still on the screen, but move the cross. So that you ask the person to track the cross, it's moving with exactly the same time course as the lines were. But as you do it, you don't see the lines move. They're fixed on the space. You're just moving your eye backwards and forwards over static bars. Yet if you think about what's happening on your retina, the image of the bars is moving across your retina because of your eye movement in exactly the same pattern as it was with the previous stimulus. So if MT was only responding to movement on the retina, regardless of how that movement was caused, it ought to respond very strongly to this. And I think most people would have predicted that, that it would. Well, it doesn't. So MT performs that very simple algebraic computation just subtracting eye movement from image movement. And it can do more subtle things too. So in this condition, for instance, track the, the line. Um, you see the bars moving, but you're tracking with them precisely. Therefore, the image of the bars, if you're tracking really is accurate, um, the, the bars are fixed on your retina, okay? You're tracking, they appear to move, but they're not moving on your eye. Well, what does MT think of that? There is no retinal movement in this condition. And yet, um, MT responds, or at least a sub-part of MT responds very strongly to that. So this must be sustained simply on the basis of the, um, the knowledge of the eye movement. You know, you know your eyes moved, you know the retinal image hasn't changed, therefore you must be following something which is moving in the world. So you see it as moving. So, you know, MT is already performing quite sophisticated computations which seem to correspond to the way that we see the world. So you make that sort of argument about the whole of the visual system. What we're seeing continuously is the activity of all these areas in our brain, each of which is doing its own little computations to tell us about what's happening. Okay. Well, um, is that all there is to it? That gives the impression that the process of vision is entirely a passive one. It's just driven from the outside. But we know that it's not. Vision is much more than just what one might call a, that sort of feed-forward computation. Let me give you a few ex examples to show the way in which vision must be dependent on some kind of running, internalized, what people call top-down, set of expectations which are interacting with what's coming in from the eyes. Um, this is, this is a, 
a, a lovely paper published by Pete Thompson from York. And you see the date, it was published in 1980, which was at the peak of um, Mar Margaret Thatcher's sort of onslaught on the educational system in various ways. And M M Margaret Thatcher was not a favorite person in the universities at that time. So he published this paper called Margaret Thatcher, A New Illusion, fairly brave thing to, to do in the circumstances. And here's the illustration from that paper. Two, two pictures of Margaret Thatcher. Um, and do you see any difference between them? It's, Margaret Thatcher, a smiling Margaret Thatcher in each case, but let's just rotate them. So what he, what he did was to just, not, not even Photoshop, he literally just cut out the image of the mouth, the image of the eyes, and inverted them. Um, and if you compare that, it's obviously immediately evident there, but if, you, if we go back to, the, um, to this, if you think about it now, it's quite obvious that the picture on the, the, the right can't be correct because the, the smile is the right way up even though the face is upside down but I just defy you to see that picture as it really is it looks like a smiling face even though the smile is in the opposite direction from the face itself but it only becomes evident when you turn it upside down so this implies that we're somehow binding together a separate analysis of the shape of the mouth and the overall shape of the face so there are signals in your brain saying there's a sort of face there I can see from the outlines of the face there's a smile as well, and it's smile shaped, so it must be a smiling face. This is a nice example of what um, psychologists call, and philosophers too, the binding problem. How we see one thing which might be composed of many different elements, its color and its form, and so on. Here's a, an extreme example of it. A smiling face actually almost certainly involves separately analyzing the facial gestures and the overall shape of the, the face. Now, just to show we're not politically partisan, here's another example. Dear Tony, um, yeah, and I saw this. Um, this is this is yet another example of what one might call top-down processes. It's a nice picture in the Independent um, many years ago, 1999, a, a front-page uh, um, article about Europe's oldest footprints, 25,000 years old. Nice, nice, beautiful example. And I looked at this and I thought, well. It doesn't look like footprints. This is, you know, this is viewing the, the, the scene of these fossilized footprints. It doesn't look, look like footprints to me at all. And then I realized that the picture, the photograph, had been printed, as it were, upside down. Let's turn it, let's turn it over. And now if you look across it, and particularly look at the, the on the left-hand side, at the impressions created by the, by the toes, they are obviously indentations in the ground. But if we go back, they don't look like indentations in the ground. They look like little hillocks. It's exactly the same physical image, just different orientations. Well, how can that be? And th this is an example of, a, of a, a shading illusion well known to psychologists who interpret it to mean that we have the expectation that light is coming from one direction, from above, because light usually does come from above in normal circumstances. Therefore, we interpret shadows as meaning either lumps or, or indentations on the basis of the assumption about where the light's coming from just one of the ways in which knowledge and expectation can help us to disambiguate the nature of the retinal um, image. A nice example. Um, this leads then to the view that uh, visual experiences are not just passively dependent on the image, they are informed by our understanding of the nature of the world. And that understanding can be derived, in, almost certainly is derived in part through evolution, just a not successive uh, uh, genetic changes which build a visual system that contains knowledge of what to expect about the world, but, but certainly in many cases through, through personal experience. Our vision is changed by what we learn about, about the world. Um, and and one, thing that we, that one of the expectations, which is probably partly innately informed and certainly partly individually learned, is the... the uh, uh, the search for faces, the desire to see faces in scenes. Faces are incredibly important to humans, so it's not, it's not surprising to find that, we, that there are specialized areas in our brains for recognized faces, faces, and that we tend to see faces even when they're not there in particular unusual circumstances, faces in the fire and all those sorts of illusions. Well, here we are. This, this is, these are images from the, um, the, the first Viking orbiter uh, mission around Mars, 
taking photographs of the surface of Mars, they are relayed back, and immediately there are headlines in the newspapers, of course, about faces on the surface of Mars. These are some of the images. The fact that this, this particular structure here is 400 kilometers long, um, you know, didn't, didn't seem to attract the interest of the newspapers. It was all about faces in, in Mars. But we, you know, we have this tendency to want to see faces in scenes to when there's even fragmentary um, in, information because faces are so important to us. I saw another example of, the, of that in the, this issue of the Daily Star with the face of Jesus found in the frying pan here. It is down at the bottom here, the frying pan view of Jesus. And the inside article told us more about it with some suggestions about, by the way, meals that they might cook in this frying pan. <laughs> Last Supper being the most obvious one, but there's some, there's some funnier ones there. Um, <laughs> yes, and uh, yeah, this was a, a, Florida, a Florida couple who'd, who'd found this in their fry, frying pan, didn't quite know what to do about it. So the gravel worker said he was discussing with his wife, Mary Lou, um, whether to sell the pan. Um, we, might well sell it, we're not really sure what to do at the moment, we're still a bit shocked about it. Two months earlier, a woman from Florida who discovered an image of the Virgin Mary in her toasted cheese sandwich sold it on eBay for 14,000 um, pounds. Now, I think this, will, this, this is a really intriguing top-down phenomenon, which can only, depend, can only depend on our personal experience of the world, and moreover, um, very particular experience, the experience of photographs. Now, I ask you to look, look at this image and just ask yourself what you think it is. Well, it's a classroom scene, but does it look real to you? And what about this? This is the Charles Bridge in Prague. Does, how do you see it? Well, you're either being terribly nervous and shy, or, or it isn't working very well. But I would say, I mean, to me, it looks like a model. Yeah? Does anyone else see that? It looks like a little, little model that's been, been photographed. And I go back to the school classroom. All those little furniture, you know, little matchstick furniture put together and then photographed. Why? It, 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 these are real scenes. So why do they look that way? Well, they look that way because they've been, they've been computationally treated to deep produce artificial defocus of the parts of the image which are closer and far away. In other words, to narrow, artificially to narrow the depth of field. And, and I would just posit that the only normal circumstances in which you'd get such narrow depth of field is in macro photography, in, in photographing small objects. And if you photograph normal scenes in, in good lighting, then it, it's very, very difficult um, to, to produce extremely narrow depth of field of this type. So the fact that this is seen, this view of Charles Bridge is seen as if it's a little model Charles, Charles Bridge, must depend on the fact that we know about the optical distortions that are produced by photographs, by photography, and that is then influencing our interpretation of what we see, which is really a pretty extreme example of learnt experience impinging directly on the way in which we interpret what we see. Well, I want to conclude just by talking about this problem, which I, which I, I, I think might convince you of the difficulty of the conventional view um, of how vision works. The conventional view is that we are taking in information continuously, it's being filtered through our retina and pixelated into detailed information, it's being analysed by our brain continuously, and we are just enjoying living in this movie of, of experience. Well, that description um, ignores or sets aside the fact that the eye is in continuous motion. I've said that there are ways of the brain distinguishing between movements produced by eye movements um, and real movements in the world, but, but there's a, another problem produced by eye movement that a different part of the scene is being delivered to the fovea of the eye every time the eye moves. You move your eye, you suddenly present this high resolution region, this very small high resolution region. It's just to give you an idea of the scale of it, it's um, equivalent to about twice the width of your thumbnail at arm's length. That's the real reason, region of high resolution vision. And beyond that, things fall off extremely quickly. That's what we're sampling the world with. And we sample it by moving it to different places, on average, three times a second. <laughs> 
Uh, some of those eye movements are voluntary. I can, I, I can deliberately decide to look up or look down, but most of them happen involuntarily, but they're happening all the time. Um, on a small scale, there's sort of half a degree or so in size, just jumping around whatever we happen to be looking at, but they can be up to 40, 50 degrees in dimensions if we're making big eye moves. That's happening all the time. Well, what does that mean? What does that tell us about the information which is actually being delivered to the brain? Not only is it filtered, so it only really is a detail from this narrow portion, but it's changing continuously. The snapshots of, of vision from just little localized bits of the field. Um, I, I've been... Um, Trying to simulate with a former student of mine, Peter Neary, who's in Aberdeen now, simulate exactly what the stimulus is that the brain receives to tell it about the world. Um, so what we did was to um, to uh, work on this movie, which is which is generated from a handheld camera, someone walking down the Promenade des Anglais in uh, in Nice, which simulates, as it were, the, a head-centered view of the world as a person looking around. But you've got to imagine that what they're looking at is superimposed on this overall head-centered view. The eye is jumping around to different things. So we simulated that um, and, and taking into account a model, a pretty accurate model, of the filtering characteristics of the retina. So this is what the, the information leaving the eye would look like around the central fovea. Right in the middle there is, is the information being transmitted by the central fovea, and it falls off in contrast and resolution quite quickly. So we have to imagine this little sampling thing jumping around within the overall head-centered view. So here it is simulated. Up in the left is that view again. Down below is what the, eye, what the eye might be sampling as it jumps around looking from place to place three times a second. And this, I could explain the algorithm that we use to drive the artificial eye movements, but you see that that's what's actually being sampled. This is what you sort of experience. That's what it looks like, but this is the, that's the sample on which you base it. If you just then... Think of what's happening in the brain. You're sitting in the visual cortex, looking at the stuff that's coming in from your eyes. What would it be? It would be those successive samples. It would look like this. This is what your visual cortex would receive. And it's on the basis of that that you see the normal, static, detailed, complete visual scene. So we have an incredibly small amount of information to, to go on, and, and simply reconstructing it even over a very small time scale is incredibly Im impressive. Okay, so then the question that, um, that I finally want to ask is how much of the past we remember and how much we need to, com to, to generate this process of constructing the field of view. And many psychologists have, and physiologists have argued that we must be sampling the world, taking views of it, um, recording, at, knowing our eye movements, piecing them together successively to produce the overall view of the field. In other words, you've got to remember the past in order to build up this gradually growing impression of the whole of what you're seeing. It's a nice idea. Computationally, in engineering terms, it, it's just a nightmare to think of doing it, the precision that you would need to match successive views. But that's pretty much the conventional view. The problem is it's got to be wrong. And let me, let me show you a very simple demonstration uh, of why it's wrong. Um, this is, uh, these are unpublished results of a little experiment that uh, V.S. Ramachandran and I did a few years ago in which we said, all right, what happens to your visual impression of things that, that, are, that were on your retina when you make an eye movement? When you move your eye, one of these small half-degree saccades, the whole field is shifted to a new position. Well, how much of what was there do you remember when you moved to a new position? So we set up a display like this in which we asked people to look in the middle, look at the cross, it doesn't matter where you look, actually, uh, and we put up a, a number of recognizable, nameable shapes, squares and triangles and, and so on, stars, and whatever, circles, which were colored with, with um, five different name, nameable colors. Um, and we simulated eye movements. So the person was, of course, making their own eye movements, but unsynchronized with their eye movements, we introduced artificial eye movements. We said, okay, what would happen if it suddenly, you suddenly made an eye movement? What, what, what would happen to your retinal image? And, and that would happen. It jumps to a new position, position, and if the viewing distance is right, you can make that whatever you like, half a degree or something. We explored a different range of eye movement sizes. So we're simulating the shift on your retina produced by an eye movement. And just, just watch. I'm going to do some more. 
Okay. Again, um, question I've asked frequently. Did anyone see anything strange during any of those? Yes, a few hands going up. Yep, right. Um, the, uh, let's run, run it again now, and I'll ask you, I'm going to run exactly the same sequence, but um, ask you to, to focus your attention on the one that's indicated by the arrow. All right? Just look in the middle, but attend to that one, and now I'm going to produce the, the movement. Okay. So it changed shape. All right? And now that one changed shape. And this one changed color. This one Change shape. Those, those are the things that were happening before. It's exactly the same sequence, but most of you saw none of those changes at all. So when even something as simple as this, a colored square, very close to your fovea, jumps by only half a degree, a typical small eye movement, you find it very difficult to, to know that there has been a change, unless you're attending to it. If there are only one or two of these things in your field, you always see the change every time. So this is a uh, this is dependent on what you retain of the past depends on what you happen to be attending to at the, at the time. And most, since we're not attending to anything except a very small part of the field, usually the part that we're directly looking at, the rest must be totally forgotten every time we make an eye movement. So here's my hypothesis about what's going on. First of all, not only is the detail of the field illusory, we know that very clearly, it's impossible the way we think we're seeing the consistency of detail of the, the, the field is incompatible with the nature of the retina. Um, the, uh, uh, whenever we make an eye movement, it's three times a second, we lose everything from the, from the past except whatever we happen to be attending to. And in, this, in these experiments, we measured how much we retain. It's about 40 or 50 bits of information. That's all out of the megabytes of stuff that we're absorbing at any one eye position. We retain about 40 bits, and it's not even spatially specific. It's almost kind of a um, semantic level. You can remember that there was a square there, maybe. Maybe it was blue, but you don't know the details of the blue, and you don't know the details of the nature of the square, its size, and so on. So we're going through the world, catch, capturing these tiny fragments of information, three times a second, translating them into an incredibly diminished, non-visual representation. Um, and that is the basis of our knowing what was present in the past, very, very limited. Knowing, for instance, um, wh where we are. You walk into a room, you see the basic features of the room with a few fixations. Okay, it's a room. Um, you then build up more and more information, not visually, but in terms of these snapshots of memory. People, perhaps familiar, some of them familiar, and so on. You're constructing a sort of hypothesis about the world that you're in. That, that, that uh, hypothesis is not being visually sustained. It's being sustained by some kind of semantic uh, memory that you're drawing from. And it's only when you have gross contradiction between that running description and the in instantaneous visual inputs that you know that there has been a change. So when you're watching a movie, you know there's been a cut, but it's not disruptive in the sense that um, you see the world shifting or changing, you just know that there has been a, a dramatic change because of the contradiction between what you're now seeing and your previous semantic description of what was, uh, what was there. So the conclusions. Um, any theory of how we really see has got to be based on a proper description of what the stimulus is. It's, it's a, an extraordinary fact that most of what we know about vision from several hundred years of experimentation is based on ob observations with eyes as stationary as possible. Go into a visual psychologist's lab and they will have trained their subjects to fixate their eyes as accurately as they possibly can on a fixation point and then they'll give a single flash so that the stimulus is delivered so quickly that the eyes can't move during the stimulus. That's a, that's a typical way that experiments are done, trying to eliminate the effect of eye movements because it's just an unnecessary complication. But that means that most of what we know about vision is derived from that very artificial situation. Um, it, go to, into the laboratory of a, of a visual neurophysiologist working on animals. They'll either be recording from anaesthetized animals, where there are no, essentially no eye movements, or from monkeys, which have also been trained to fixate on a particular point as hard as they possibly can while stimuli are being moved around in the field. So we have this very artificial view of how the visual system works from experiments in which um, the animal or the human being is not allowed to, essentially not allowed to, uh, to move their eyes. So we really do need to understand what the nature of the stimulus is. And what it is, is like that reconstruction of those experiments with Peter Neary. 
second conclusion is there's no visual part. There's no visual past. There's a past which is very small in informational content. It's restricted to what we're attending to, and it's not image-based. So there's no, that, the past is illusory too. Uh, visual interpretation then is dependent on attention. Basically, you remember um, the semantic nature of whatever it is you happen to be attending to. And most of what we see is as much cognitively informed by our expectations as it is validated by the input that's actually coming from, uh, um, from our eyes. So my conclusion is that um, vision is not quite impossible. It really is um, extraordinarily impressive, uh, the disparity between the nature of our subjective experiences and the reality of what we know is happening in our, in our eyes and our brains. Thank you. Well, what a splendid talk that was. I thought the representation of how little we really, our visual memory, how poor it is. I love, I love the fact that all the way through it, there were examples of it. The video, the Wiseman video at the beginning that showed the four changes of color, but none of us noticed why the cards were changing color. I thought were excellent. I, I'd love to know about the man in the monkey suit that was sitting to the right hand side. There's a story to that, so that's great. And um, the fact that the experiments that we saw portrayed about the passive, active, and tracked motion on the research that you carried out and the different regions of the brain that were activated by that. And the marvelous films at the end, which showed how little we're actually looking at at any given time and how our brain top down reconstructs everything that we see. We think it's a really excellent talk. Thank you very much. Okay. Our first question, say who you are. Hello, uh, Adam Bennett, Electronic Theatre Controls. Now that the world is more and more illuminated with solid state lighting, which is being modulated and flickering at a higher frequency than we can observe directly, when we cast our gaze across a scene and we see multiply illuminated copies of that scene, how do you think that might affect our memory or semantic knowledge of the scene and or our thinking even? Would it have an effect on our cognitive abilities? Thank you. Okay, I mean, it's a very interesting question. Um, First of all, I mean, we are, we're obviously aware, um, if, if not very explicitly, um, of the, the fact that um, some of our visual experiences are punctuated like that, particularly movies and television. Um, the, the, the reaction to, um, to The Hobbit, which was filmed at um, 50 frames, was it? I mean, there was, yeah, I think it was 50 frames, in order to produce a much more convincing representation of movement, not at all jerky, however fast it was. The reaction from audiences, as I read it, was that it was just peculiar, that they didn't really kind of, not that they didn't like it, but it was clearly different from the normal cinematic experience in a way that was not necessarily pleasing. Odd, because it's more like, obviously, a better approximation to reality, to have more frames per second than, than fewer, but we've just become so accustomed to the conventions and the grammar of, if you like, of, of cinematography and of, of films, that that's how we expect them to be. And when they're not like that, when they're more like reality, they, they seem odd and bizarre. The um, yeah, problem of punctuation while you're making eye movements, I think, is not so great an issue because um, you're, you're, to a large extent, um, insensitive to visual information during eye movements for two reasons. One, the image, unless very bright, um, is, uh, is spread and smeared across your retina, so that the contrast is so much reduced by your own very rapid eye movement um, that um, elements of the image become undetectable. Unless the contrast present in the image is extremely high um, or very, very briefly presented during an eye movement, it will go undetected because of the smearing across many photoreceptors. 
Um, there's also a, a genuine change of, of sensitivity, an overall change of sensitivity, regardless of the image that happens during an eye movement, a phenomenon called um, saccadic suppression. But that's not a very large um, phenomenon. But the other point is that, as you've seen from, if I've convinced you, um, after every eye movement, we essentially lose all information from the past any, anyway. So I think that you know, we're not as aware of the problems of repetitive um, uh, illumination uh, as you might expect us to be, because of the fact that, that our visual experience doesn't depend on knowledge of, of the past. So we're only really a, a aware of when our eyes are relatively stationary, um, and we're aware of what's happening now, rather than any kind of comparison with past, the past events. Another question, please. Graham Phillips. Has, um, has there a lot of work been done on finding out the effect of other sensory stimuli on the visual system? I'm thinking of the auditory system and the others. We, don't, we know them in detail on their own, but how do they interact? That, well, that's, I, mean, I would have planted that question if you'd asked me to, to do so, because that, the... the, the um, I'm now involved in, in running a, a big research project funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council, believe it or not, on, on the senses, um, which involves trying to, to put together views from philosophy and, and from science. And the major theme that's emerged has been the interaction between the senses, uh, which is deeply worrying to some philosophers because um, the concept of the, of the individuation and the separation of the senses has been absolutely central to philosophy from, from Aristotle's time, you know, the five basic senses. Um, and there is, there's an, there is a non-trivial point here. If you think about it, although we know that vision has many, many different aspects, even being analyzed in different parts of the brain now, you know, movement and depth and color and form and so on, faces, um, there's, there's never any doubt about whether your experience is visual or something else. Say you're driving along at night and you, you know, something's in the distance, you're not quite sure what it is. You never say, well, there's something out there, I'm not sure whether it's, a, it's something visual or whether it's a sound. There's never any confusion between one sort of sensory experience and a, an Aristotelian different sort of sensory experience. And yet, despite that, and we don't have any understanding of the physiological basis of that essential distinction between a sound type experience and a visual type experience. But what's becoming clear is that they talk to each other, that the senses are interacting all the time. And one of the dr most dramatic examples, really compelling examples, is between sound and vision. And it's the fact that what you hear someone saying is influenced by the way in which their lips move. It's a phenomenon called the McGurk effect. So you can play a single syllable being repeated, say, computer-generated, identical, ba, 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 ba. But if you look at synchronized lip movements, what you actually hear depends on the shape of the lips. So if the lips are going ga, 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 you hear it as more like ga, ga, ga than ba, ba, ba. So it shifts what you hear, depending on, and, and the mechanisms for that are at least, at least partly understood, the interactions between the visual system and the auditory system. Well, there's now a huge catalog of similar sorts of effects between color and taste, um, and between hearing and touch, for instance, between your perception of your body and, and the, uh, the sense of, uh, of, of touch in relation to other things. If you hold a stick, for instance, and touch distant objects with the stick, and then ask people to estimate how long their hands are, give them a scale to estimate, they'll overjudge the length of their hands as if the stick had become part of their own body um, image. So there are interactions, and it depends on the tapping of the stick. So there are myriad examples now of interactions between the, uh, the senses, um, and that is, that's the theme of the, the research project that I'm most involved in at the moment. That was a very good question, because actually in June, we are organizing a joint event between the Society of Light and Lighting and the Institute of Acoustics called Casting Light on Sound, about the effect of light and sound together, which we're just formulating at the moment. So that's a good, good question. Yes, there's someone there. Hi there, Mark Simon. Um, you your mentioned earlier on about contrast. We see everything in color. However, when we look at a black and white photograph, a black and white picture, it tends to be more drawing, more interesting to the mind. How can you explain how that is when we see most things in colour most of the time? 
I think that's a wonderful question. And again, something I've been thinking about a lot recently. Um, but it, it, it's obvious, even from that, an, that sort of anecdotal uh, example, that color is a sort of optional extra in visual experience. Even though you might, it might think it's an essential quality of things, it helps us to recognize what things are, certainly knowing what color they are. And some people will say it's part of the pleasure of visual experience to have that dimension of color. But it, it's clear from many different um, roots of evidence the, 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 the colors of experience are sort of added on to the basic process of analyzing shape and form and distance and, and movement. I mean, for one thing, there are these rare examples of achromatopsia in which people can lose color while everything else about their visual experience is, is normal. They don't have any difficulties getting around the world. Occasionally, they might make errors in identifying individual things. Uh, another line of evidence comes from an evolutionary argument. Um, the use of color as an important part of regulating behavior, at least amongst mammals, is restricted to primates, as far as we know. Um, until, what, something like 60 million, 50 million years ago, um, mammals had only two cone pigments, green and blue catching pigments. They could have made color discrimination, and they can make color discriminations within that range by comparing the activity of those two cone types. But it doesn't really seem to play a major part in the behavior of most mammals. You can train a cat, for instance, to make color discriminations. It takes tens of thousands of successive trials to get the cat up to a well above chance performance in making color discriminations. Uh, color discriminations that a monkey could learn to make in two or three trials. So suddenly in the primate, something happened which made color important. And that, that thing that happened was a mutation which generated the red catching pigment. So instead of two, there were three. And it broadened the range of wavelengths that the eye could detect, but also gave more information about chromatic differences, which then supports color vision. It, no other mammals except primates have that V4 area, which seems to be devoted to color. So that's quite a late evolutionary de development. And, and there's a lot of psychological evidence as well that the the relationship between form and color is labile. It's created, it's analyzed individually for everything, virtually everything that we look at. So when you look at a colored object, you, you form instantaneously a, a kind of working memory of what that object, say a red square, and that's a red square. But it's not that you're using detection mechanisms for red squares in your brain. You're creating some kind of association temporarily between redness and squareness. The two things have to be bound together every time. So every color that you're seeing is being individually applied, overlaid, if you like, on basically a monochromatic analysis um, of the world. Okay, I think um, a couple more questions would be very nice. And uh, yes, is somebody, somebody over there? Uh, what does the uh, legal profession think of you as far as um, uh, expert witness, um, witnesses in a crime? <laughs> Uh, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a very important uh, issue, um, and in fact, the legal profession has paid a lot of attention to the change blindness literature and the um, unreliability of eyewitness testimony. Um, the the um, evidence, the earliest evidence that really drew their attention to this came from a woman called uh, Elizabeth Loftus, a psychologist from the University of, um, uh, of Washington in Seattle, um, who created movies representing crime scenes, essentially representing a series of experiences that might have been associated, let's say, with a crime, with an imagined crime, asking people to watch these and then testing the reliability of their recall. And it was absolutely awful. And what's more, she discovered the power of, um, of suggestion because she, should, she could, by planting one question, say, um, what happened to the green car? and the street scene. Even when there wasn't a green car, almost all of the people involved in the experiment would immediately invent, confabulate a story about this imagined green car. And when asked back the next day to recall again, there would be the green car firmly fixed in their memories, even more securely than before. So planting, you know, planting um, suggestions can completely change um, memories of past experience. And the, the legal profession, I think, has taken that on board, even though I'm, eyewitness testimony is still you know, a very, very important part of, of the procedure in court. It's incredibly unreliable. As you saw from the movie, you know, imagine that you'd been asked in a court of law, 
describe what happened in that movie of the card trick. What, what, what color was the tablecloth? <laughs> so we're terribly unreliable. Okay, and uh, one more question. Yes. Seems to be me, Bob Anderson, used to work for the BBC television. Um, what interests me is the similarity between some of the things that you're now discovering and what clever people like yourself put into the television system 20 or 30 years ago, which is generally known as MPEG, Motion Picture Experts Group. They have built into the system, which we now enjoy, um, which I would personally have said 10 years ago, even certainly 30 years ago, was totally impossible. The television system we have in most parts of the world gets so much information uh, into a very limited bandwidth, and all done by, I was going to say by mirrors, but no, it's done by very clever computers working at astonishing speeds and comparing some of the things which you've been finding within the eyes computation. Um, how have you learned anything from the way this MPEG system works? And have you got any more surprises for us so that suddenly television is going to get even more impossible? Yeah. I, well, I have to say, with, um, you know, with respect, that um, a lot of the information ideas went in the other direction. They, they went from pre-existing knowledge of the way in which the retina filters and compresses information. Um, and, and that knowledge was then used to guide um, uh, information compression in, in video techniques. So, for instance, the retina has essentially spatially and temporally differentiates the image, um, just detecting boundaries, principally anyway, detecting boundaries of contrast and ignoring information about extended areas of, of similar um, intensity because there's no additional information. And again, tending to neglect information or throw away information about steady, unchanging visual stimuli and then only detecting the temporal changes as well. And that's a trick which is used in, um, in, in MPEG, the assumption that, that, that if there's no transition in the intensity information, it'll just be continuous, so you don't need to preserve that. Uh, and the same is true uh, in, the, in the eye. So there's a lot of flow, of, I think, of knowledge from early work on the retina in the 1940s into um, information compression in visual systems. Well, uh, there is a, you know, potentially a further development, but it would have to be on a kind of individual basis. If, um, as we, we, we know, you're only really absorbing information in any kind of detail from your fovea, it's impossible to do so in the periphery, then you could make an individualized movie um, for one viewer, uh, which was locked to their eye movements. So you'd only need to heighten and, and, and um, make detailed the image in the part of the screen that the person was actually looking at. And there, there's experimental evidence that shows this true. If you um, show people a page of text, detailed text, newspaper or something like that, and you measure their eye movements as they're looking around and reading this, you can essentially change all of the text except for a very tiny area around the word that they're looking at and make nonsense of it. I mean, it has to look vaguely like text, but it can be complete nonsense, a different language or whatever, and they'll be entirely unaware of that. If, if you could compute quickly enough so that as the eye moves, you suddenly sharpen up and make correct that particular word that they're looking at. And they jump from word to word, they read at exactly the same speed that they would if the whole page was, was present. So you could compute an individual movie for one viewer where you only had to have high-resolution high information for whatever it was that they happened to look at. The problem with, you know, general, the problem with movies and television is that um, they have to suit everyone, so they have to be like the real world because anyone could be looking anywhere at any time on the movie, um, on the movie frame. So it's got to be done in reasonable resolution so as to support adequately the visual experience of anybody looking at any point in that scene. Okay, just to finish off, I just like, wondered if you could tell us about, um, there's a, a cinema documentary that was released very recently. It's called Tim's Vermeer, and it's about 
work on trying to reconstruct the optical devices that it's alleged that Vermeer used when he did his paintings. And Professor Blakemore was a, um, a contributor to that program and it was nominated for a BAFTA award only last week. So I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit about that. Very briefly, this is, it's, it's a nice movie, but please go and see it. I'm not earning any money from it, so I can, I can encourage you to go and see it without any kind of self-interest. It's a nice um, documentary. It didn't win the BAFTA, but it was indeed, as you say, nominated for a BAFTA, which is nice. Uh, and it's about a um, um, computer engineer, very uh, influential and successful software engineer, um, Tim Jennison, who lives in San Antonio, who was a pioneer in video streaming techniques. Um, he, he founded a company called New Tech, um, which developed the first software for video streaming to PCs. And he's a lot involved in computer graphics and, and CGI and things like that now. And he was given a copy of, um, uh, by the way, he, he, he dropped out of university after the first term, didn't complete a university degree. Um, he was given a copy of a book by David Hockney, which some of you I'm sure know, called Secret Knowledge published in 2001, where Hockney makes the argument that um, art, representational artists in the Renaissance from about, he, very, very specific, from 1430 onwards, that was the first example, um, uh, were using optical devices to make images and then using those images to, to help them to draw, to get proportions right and so on. Um, and he traces this you know, sudden appearance of sort of realistic type painting those artists who were probably using optics and those who weren't through the whole of the Renaissance through to the 19th century. And his argument essentially is that the history of photography didn't begin in, in 1830 or whatever the textbook would say. It actually began in 1430 because there was, from 1430 onwards, some people were attempting to convert an optical image um, into a pictorial representation. But they did it with paint rather than with emulsion or, or whatever. Um, um, and they must have been using tricks, clever methods for doing that. Well, this, this co computer engineer from San Antonio thought, well, exactly what did they do? And it, it was known that the camera obscura, you know, which is just a way of forming an image with either a pinhole inside a dark room or with a, with a single lens, single um, biconvex lens, um, those things existed. Um, and they were known publicly, and people went to look at them or were very excited by them. And certainly some artists even owned them. There's clear evidence Canaletto owned one, for instance. But how did you actually, how can you actually use that to help you to choose the pigment? You could use it projecting in a room to help you to draw an outline, and that would be good to get the basic shapes, but then you have to take that out and paint it. Could you use it to, to, to guide the actual choice of brightness and color of the paint? Because was for, the, for the greatest of the um, of the Renaissance painters for you know, Caravaggio and for uh, Van Eyck and for, for Holbein and Vermeer and so on. What's, what's amazing is the capacity to represent gradients of color and brightness so convincingly to the eye when our eyes can't really even see those, those things correctly. Well, we might expect all sorts of illusions to have been painted by the artist, you know, painting what they perceive rather than the reality of what's there. And this guy had invented this, he played with optics went to uh, Vermeer's studio in, or house in, uh, in, in Delft, learnt Dutch, read all the original. For 10 years, he devoted his life to trying to understand what Vermeer did, as the, some people would say the greatest representational painter. Um, and he discovered tricks using very small, very simple optical components, which allowed him, with no training in painting at all, he'd never had any artistic painting, to produce a replica of... Vermeer's masterpiece, The Music Room, which is just breathtaking. I mean, you can go online and look at it. It's just simply unbelievable, the quality and the detail. There's a, there's a, a rug, a, um, a Turkish rug laid over a table where every stitch is drawn perfectly. It's just an amazing, amazing piece of, of painting, and it's done through the use of optical um, aids. He simply uses a single lens, convex lens, form an image, uses a convex mirror at the focal point to reproject exactly the same image uh, onto, a, onto a drawing surface and a piece of flat mirror. This is the really clever trick, what he calls a comparator mirror, which you hold at a particular crucial point. It's mounted in a device to make sure it lies always in a plane that's confocal with the drawing surface. You just move it and view through it. 
looking backwards through the optics, you can see brightly and clearly the original scene in his mind. And so just by moving your head from side to side, you can see the painting surface confocal below it. And you can just choose pigment that exactly matches what you're seeing in the mirror. And because it's a small mirror, it's sampling from individual points, so it provides colour and brightness information uncontaminated by the comparison information around it. So although he didn't realise this at the time, it allows the eye to get over a lot of the, the effects due to lateral interactions, chromatic and brightness interactions, and just produce a faithful replica of what each point on the retina is receiving. So it's almost kind of paint by numbers, but you just do it through an optical device. And although it took him a long time to paint, it took him six months to paint it, the, the, the copy is simply staggering in its, in its, uh, in its detail. It's a nice, it's a lovely story. And by the way, Vermeer took six or seven months to paint every painting too. He was notorious for how long he took to paint. So, I don't know, but the art historians are still divided on the issue, but more and more of them, particularly, I think, partly because of this film, have become convinced that Vermeer must have been using optics. Thank you, excellent. Thank you.